little suspects they're not here. <laughs> Check back. She good? We're good? Charlie is on a uh, cruise. Charlie Council? Oh, well, then Bill would be too, probably. They go to prison. Cruise is like one at a time. Charlie and Bill. Oh, yeah, nobody sits in their They leave their That's seats the open. Designated. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably the a usual print, suspects there. a body print in the, yeah. in the cushion. <laughs> Good color on you. Oh, thanks. Very good color on you. What am I, Chuck Liver? Uh, no, red. Her no, red. you look good. Oh, oh, Howard, you look stunning. <laughs> <laughs> Put you up. You look awesome too. Good morning. It is 9 a.m. Welcome to the April 18th, 2018 City Council meeting. Two weeks went by just like that. We're back here already. Uh, please stand first for an invocation and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity in government to share to this meeting for a time of refreshment of spirit and fellowship. Help us to work and think and pray together that we may be more perfectly fitted to serve you, those with whom we work in the task in which we have been called. Help us, God, to look wise and reflect thy wisdom, fill us with high ideals, Empower us with love and goodwill to all, that we may rightly lead in the paths of chivalry and honor. And all this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, John. Uh, before we start with the proclamations, let the record reflect that all city council members and officials are present. First, we have two proclamations, the first of which is Arbor Day, which Council Member Prafke will present. Good morning and thank you. I'm honored to do this. Uh, proclamation, City of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this holiday, called Arbor Day, was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska and is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And Whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other products. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of the business areas, beautify our community, and are a source of joy and spiritual renewal wherever planted. And whereas the city has celebrated Arbor Day and has been recognized by the Arbor Day Foundation as a Tree City USA for 24 years, has received the Tree City USA Growth Award for 12 years, and was awarded the prestigious Sterling Award by the National Arbor Day Foundation in February 2013. And whereas the city desires to continue to support efforts to care for our community forest and educate our citizens on its importance. Now therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida does hereby proclaim April 27, 2018 as Arbor Day and urges all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day, support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Passed and duly adopted in regular session this 18th day of April, 2018, City of Punta Gorda, Florida, signed Rachel Keesling, Mayor. And accepting is Joan LeBeau, our Urban Design Manager. Joan LeBeau, Urban Design Manager, thank you very much. On behalf of the city, I accept this proclamation and we will be celebrating Arbor Day in May this year. So we will keep you informed and stay tuned to our new program. Thank you. Thank you. Next 
we have a proclamation for Law Day. Councilmember Cummings will present. Proclamation, City of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas Law Day is the, sorry, in the words of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, co-established nationwide commemoration, the day of national dedication for the principles of <coughs> government under law. And whereas the United States Constitution vests legislative, executive, and judicial power in the Congress, the President, and the one Supreme Court, respectively, and whereas the three separate powers of the national government share power and each also shares the check on the power of the others, and whereas separation of powers provides a framework for freedom, but this framework is not self-executing, as we the people must continually act to ensure our constitutional democracy endures, preserving our liberties and guaranteeing our rights. And whereas the 2018 Law Day theme enables us to reflect on the separation of powers as fundamental to our constitutional purpose and to consider how our governmental system is working for ourselves and our prosperity. Now, therefore, the city of City Council of City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim Tuesday, May 1st, 2018, as Law Day Separation of Powers Framework for Freedom Day in Punta Gorda, and urges all community residents, schools, businesses, and civic groups, news media, legal professionals, and law students to support this national day by participating in Law Day activities and to use this occasion to preserve and strengthen the rule of law. Passed until adopted in regular session this 18th day of April, 2018, City of Punta Gorda, by um, Mayor Rachel Kiesling. This is presented to David Levitt. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Laws are good. <laughs> At least the ones that we like. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, next we have a couple of special presentations, two service awards, and then a certificate and a new branding. So let's start with the person who's been here the longest. And uh, this Hi. is... Uh, if you ever had questions with your utility billing or collections, you probably reached this person at some point in time over the past 30 years. Shelly Barber, come on up. 30 years. One of my last duties here at the city is I have the honor of giving you the 30 years. They want to take your picture? And um, Shelly started uh, 30 years ago as a meter reader for the city, and she got smart after four years and said it's too hot and buggy, so she came inside. And from what I understand, she still is called upon when they can't having trouble, the new people are having trouble finding meters, she still remembers where some of the meters are. So they, when they have a difficult customer, they pass it on to Shelly because she, her infectious laugh and her sense of humor just really comes forth. I know you're an uh, animal lover. You take in animals like crazy. And whenever, and we get all these compliment letters and they usually say it's because of Shelly. So I am very happy. I've worked with you 25 years. I'm just, this is my <coughs> last official duty on saying on a 30 year employee anyway, but good luck to you, okay? Oh, thank you. You've been really thank good. You. Thank you. No speech. No, the next person will take care of it. Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, the next person is a 10-year service award for uh, some people know him as uh, Lieutenant Tony Laurenti from the fire department. We know him because he's got what's called the gift of gab. <laughs> Tony, come on up. <laughs> good in a tie. Ray Briggs, Ray Briggs, Fire Chief. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tony that maybe you don't know. A few things, so he may get embarrassed. We'll see. Uh, so first of all, congratulations. Tony and his family have lived in the area since the 1930s. Didn't know that. He's married to his wife here from Punta Gorda, and in fact, they were engaged under a tree at Gilcrest Park, which is Aww. interesting. They have one child, Enzo, who attends Punta Gorda Middle. Um, we, we've all known, learned to grow and, and love him. Um, Tony actually left uh, Charlotte County and went to work. He, he enrolled in the Air Force, and he did a tour under the first, uh, in the first Gulf War. And after the Bosnian conflict, he came back. He actually joined the National Guard during the second Gulf War and um, actually served our state during hurricane season 2004. So sir, and that's where he... He uh, developed a passion for the fire service, and ultimately we were able to scoop him up at that point. Um, 
uh, just when he's worked, since he's worked for us in the past 10 years, I got to tell you what a blessing to our department and just read, read a couple of things that he has accomplished. Um, so number one, he takes great pride in serving his hometown and that level of commitment and uh, passion for his hometown has truly been admirable and contagious. So we really appreciate that. He is one of our fire inspectors. He's got that certification. He's a pump operator and engineer, a rescue diver, and certainly has uh, grown to the rank of um, lieutenant. So as one of our uh, lead paramedics in our early program, he helped develop our ALS program as well. So in the first 10 years, quite an accomplishment, and we're really looking forward to the next. So congratulations. How are y'all doing today? <laughs> I'm gonna keep it, keep it pretty short. Um, uh, I'm a big fan, like my passion is civics and civil service, and I dedicated my life to civil service um, when I was young, 17 is when I uh, first signed up for the military. And then I've tried to just continue uh, throughout my life that. I mean, it's not the most glamorous uh, at times, but uh, uh, to me, it's the most important thing I can do is serve my country and then, uh, more precisely serve this community, my community. Uh, it's a, a privilege to me to be able to serve uh, the town that I live in. So, and uh, yeah, the, the first 10 years, and I look forward to the next 20, or next 10. <laughs> <laughs> These are the kind of people that you get to respond when you call for services, and, and thank you, Tony. I first met Tony, he was, he was the rep for the, uh, the union when I first became a council member, so um, he gave that job up pretty quickly after that. He didn't last long in that position, but it was, it was good to get to know, know the, fire, the fire staff and, and immediately <coughs> when I first became a council member, so thank you for that, thank you. Okay, next we have a special certificate. We have the IE, IEMO, which is the Institute for Elected Municipal Officials, Level 3, the Leadership Challenge, which was completed by Council Member Jaha Cummings. And next we have a special presentation by the Peace River Wildlife Center to introduce their new branding. Good morning, everybody. Pat Campagna, a board, board member of the Peace River Wildlife Center. I, I think that um, whenever we get referred to by anybody in the community, it's usually we're called the bird sanctuary. And we are so much more than a bird sanctuary. Um, and our new branding is going to reflect the fact that not only do we take care of uh, avian creatures, but we also take care of ma all mammals and also reptiles. Uh, we, as we get ready to, uh, for big changes next year, um, we decided to look to g change our branding and uh, have so that it reflects a total picture of who we are. And this is our new branding. Um, we also want to thank the uh, city council who have been continuously support, supporting us. We, we totally appreciate it. We also want the community to know that we uh, are not going to be breaking ground this year, that we probably will be delayed until next April. We are waiting, um, as is the city, waiting for uh, the design of the park to be completed. Um, but we're going to use this time in a very good way, and uh, we look forward to breaking ground and sharing with the community a brand new uh, Peace River Wildlife Center. Um, we have certificates of appreciation for city council for everything that they've done for us and, and their continued support of us. Aww. With a new logo. With a new logo. Oh gosh, With a new logo. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. So Very nice. So keep, uh, stay tuned. Thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't get one for Howard. I said, uh, oh, 
Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll definitely get it to you. <laughs> liver. Thank you. <laughs> Peace. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Guys. you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have introduction of, introduction of Border Committee member nominees. If your name is in the running for a Border Committee and you would like to briefly introduce yourself, now would be the time. <laughs> would anybody like to introduce themselves for a Border Committee position? Please take this podium right over here. State your name and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Adrienne Andre. I'm interested in the Historic Preservation Board. I'm a realtor at Remax Harbor. I grew up here, so thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Bradford Gamblin, and I am a nominee for the Historic Preservation Board uh, position. I am an alternate now, and I've been privileged to serve on virtually every meeting since I've been named an alternate and would like to move to the permanent position. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Anybody else? <coughs> okay, seeing none, we will move into the public hearing portion of the agenda. We have four public hearings and one quasi-judicial, the first of which is GA03-18. Yes, this is the um, first reading, which was continued from March 21st, and I'll read this by title only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending Chapter 6, Boats, Docks, and Waterways, Article 1, in general, Section 6-24, use of boat ramps, Punta Gorda Code, to amend regulations relating to the use of public boat ramps and to establish regulations for the use of public day docks within the City of Punta Gorda, providing for conflict and severability, and providing an, effect, an effective date. And this, the draft that you have before you um, was um, modified to include the city's uh, Council's um, um, changes from the last meeting. Okay. Yes. Lynn? Um, there's just one thing that I noted was not included in the ordinance changes. Um, it's something we talked about at the last meeting. We talked about uh, <coughs> limiting the maximum length of dinghies on the Gilchrist Day Dock in order to keep the larger boats off of that dock, and that is not incorporated into the document. Um, and at, at, as I recall from the last meeting, we talked about 11 feet, but I have since talked to a number of people who have dinghies that are 11.6 to 11.9. So I would like to make a recommendation that we add the verbiage of that do, uh, dinghies no late longer than 12 feet be added into the ordinance. I'm sorry, that was 12 feet? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I would suggest that we add a, a new subparagraph 5 to... Um, Paragraph B, and uh, perhaps you can read, uh, it would read, vessels docking at the Gilchrist Landing day docks shall be limited to a maximum overall length of 12 feet. Obviously, I mean, if we have an emergency situation and someone has to use the dock for a short period of time, it would be a different story. But for, for general purposes, I think we probably need to include that just so we don't have the same situation occur again. And otherwise, I think all the changes are exactly what we talked about. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Lynn. I have an 11 foot six inch dam. I can use. Well, we're going to be measuring, so I'm glad you're. Okay. I'm glad we're putting <laughs> putting 12 feet, so you're you're able to do yeah. what you need to do. Um, any other comments? Okay, this is a public hearing. If you would like to speak on GA 03-18, now would be the time. Please take this podium. State your name. Anybody like to speak on GA 03-18? Anybody, last call, come to the podium. State, you've got to speak in the microphone. You've got to state your name, and you have three minutes. This should take less. My name is Richard Kirschhofer. I live in PGI. I have a comment that may or may not be directly related to it, but it's the parking at the ramp at Lashley Park. We've gone several times with uh, our boat loaded up to find no parking. And <clears throat> there's no alternate parking if you have a boat on a trailer. And uh, in all cases, there's plenty of spots taken by single cars. If you go in the afternoon where there, it is legal to park with a single car, you may still find the same situation. So since a lot of the uh, homes can no longer launch boats from their houses and the area is growing, there's more demand. And I think um, uh, single cars should not be allowed to park there anytime. And that way it'll alleviate a little bit of the stress. So uh, 
We've also gone by car just to see if parking's available and watched other people circle <coughs> and leave with their boats because there's no place to park and there's no alternate <coughs> parking. And uh, you can drive over to Ponce Park and find the same situation. And uh, so your, your day ends and you take your boat home and you disappoint your company. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak on GA03-18? You've got to come to the podium, state your name. You have three minutes. Anybody else? Last call. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. Unanimously. Um, this this uh, ordinance only um, talks about the day dock situation. It does not address any parking in Lashley Park, but we'll note that. Um, Move approval of GA-03-18. As which, amended. Today. As amended. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the ordinance as amended. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Next we have ZA-02-18. Yes, this is the first reading of an ordinance, which I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending Punta Gorda Code, Chapter 26, Land Development Regulations, Article 16, Application Review and Approval Requirements, <coughs> Section 16.8, Special Exception Approval, Paragraph Q1, Extending the Termination of Use for Special Exception Approvals, which require permitting from non-city governmental agencies, providing for conflict and severability, and providing an effective date. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official for the record. Um, special exceptions expire two years from the date of approval unless a permit or occupancy permit has been issued for the use. City Council recently approved a special exception request. However, the project will require extensive state and federal permitting, which is anticipated to take over two years to secure. Due to the time and expense in preparing the complex permitting applications, the applicant opted to seek City Council uh, the city's approval for the use first. As the code is currently written, there's no flexibility in the two-year termination time frame. The proposed amendment would allow the city council to grant additional time up to five years for approved special exception uses, which require extensive state and federal permitting. An application for an extension of the approved special exception must be made no less than 90 days prior to the date of the expiration of the special exception. As part of the application, the property owner shall demonstrate that since the date of the special exception approval, it has been pursuing in good faith all required government governmental authorizations for its proposed use and additional time is necessary to secure all such approvals. There was one typo um, on the last sentence. It said addition time. It should be additional time. We can change that, correct that. Planning Commission and Urban Design uh, staff recommend approval of ZA 02-18. And just so it's clear, it would be a total overall of five years, not, right. not five plus the two. Okay. Any questions or comments for uh, staff? David's comment is consistent with the conversation that we've had before, so. Okay, if any, this is a public hearing. If anybody would like to speak on ZA02-18, now would be the time. Would anybody like to speak on ZA02-18? <coughs> Last call, please stand, rise, and make your way to this podium if you would like to speak on ZA02-18. Move to close public hearing. Second. <coughs> a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Carried unanimously. Motion to approve ZA-02-18. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ZA-02-18 with the, with the correction. Mm -hmm. yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. Mayor? Okay, next we have ZA-03-18. two-minute break so we can take Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just Before we hear that, we got to fix our little timer. So we have the IT director. So two minutes. Talk, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I didn't want to speak behind us again. <laughs> okay, we're going to continue on now with ZA03-18. Yes, and this is the first reading, which I'll read by title mm -hmm. only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending Punta Gorda Code, Chapter 26, Land Development Regulations, Article 3, Regulating Districts, Section 3.1b, Overlay Districts, 
adding section 3.19 airport protection overlay district APO pursuant to chapter 333 Florida statutes to establish airport protection zoning regulations within the city of Punta Gorda for property in the vicinity of public use airports in the city limits of the city of Punta Gorda providing for conflict and severability and providing an effective date. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official. Uh, this ordinance is being brought before you pursuant to the statutory requirements of Chapter 333, Florida statutes. All governments in the state of Florida are required to adopt airport protection standards for lands within the vicinity of a public use airport by implementing their own land development regulations at a local level. The purpose of these regulations is to establish reasonable protections for the airport operations of and aircraft to minimize the exposure of adjacent properties to the airport hazards and noise and to prohibit incompatible land uses and structures around the airports. Portions of the downtown and the loop properties fall within this airport protection area. The draft ordinance is mirrored to Charlotte County's airport protection ordinance adopted in 2017, and there have been no changes or updates to the Charlotte County's ordinance since adoption. Planning Commission and Urban Design recommend approval of ZA 03-18. Questions for staff? No. This is ZA 03-18. If anybody would like to speak on this, this now would be the time. ZA 03-18, airport protection overlay district anybody like to speak on that item please make your way to this podium if you would like to speak last call anybody like to speak on ZA 03-18 move to close public hearing second we have a motion a second to close the public hearing all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed carried unanimously move approval of ZA-03-18 second we have a motion and a second to approve ZA 03-18. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Next we have ZA 05-18. Yes, this is the first reading of an ordinance, which I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending Punta Gorda Code, Chapter 26, Land Development Regulations, Article 3, Regulating Districts, Section 3.13M, SRO, Special Residential Overlay District, to clarify regulations relating regarding fence heights, providing for conflict and severability and providing an effective date. Good morning again, Lisa Hannon, zoning official. Um, this is being brought back to you after um, discussion regarding fence height. It's uh, staff <coughs> has to interpret the code literally and the code originally stated 48 inches overall height. Um, their contractors have uh, express the need for a little bit of wiggle room the way the um, ground is contoured at times to make a fence be evenly installed. So this uh, amendment would allow for the fence panels not to exceed 48 inches in height and the maximum vertical clearance between the finished grade and the bottom of the panel shall be no more than four inches and fence posts shall not exceed 54 inches above finished grade. And in addition, that any fence or wall being used as a residential swimming pool barrier in accordance with state law shall be permitted to meet the minimum barrier requirements required by the Residential Pool Safety Act. Uh, my question is, did we talk to the fence contractors? Did we talk to the gentleman that had come back here? Did we run this by him? I, he has seen this, yes. Okay. And he was okay with it? Yes. Okay. Any other questions for staff? This is ZA 05-18. If anybody would like to speak on this item, now would be the time. Please take this podium to my right. State your name. You have three minutes. Wendy Mueller. Um, this is really just a question. Are the fences that already exist going to be grandfathered, or if needed to be replaced, would they have to drop to four feet? The um, existing fences that are non-conforming to the new regulations would be considered as uh, legal non-conformities so they can continue. And um, with, res with respect to non-conformities in our code, um, Lisa, would you? Once a non-conformity is removed or has to be removed or replaced, it has to be um, installed or constructed in conformance with the current code. Now. But the question would be whether that applies to the entire fence or individual panels. If the, it would depend on the um, 
amount, if it's more than 50% of the value of the fence, then the entire thing would have to come into conformance. But this is for special residential overlay district only, which has had a maximum fence height of 48 inches since I believe the 80s. So this doesn't include the downtown districts. This is for Punta Gorda Isles, Bernstor Isles, and Bernstor Meadows only. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so it's no change. Yeah, this gives it <coughs> more flexibility because in the past we were failing the fence permits because of the four Correct. inches and they needed that little bit to make it work. Correct. Mm -hmm. Anybody else like to speak on ZA05-18? Make your way to the podium. Last call, anybody? ZA05-18. Move to close public hearing. Second. We have a motion a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Move approval of ZA-05-18. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ZA-05-18. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. <coughs> okay, next we have a quasi-judicial SE-02-18, which um, anybody who wants to speak needs to be sworn in. Any, anyone that's going to be providing evidence or testimony needs to rise to be sworn in by the clerk at this time, please. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in today's proceedings? I do. When you're ready to speak, please come to the podium, state your name, and indicate that you've been sworn. This is SC-02-18, a request by Royce Dockrell as agent for Valiant PG Corp property owner for a special exception. Pursuant to Chapter 26, Section 16.8, Punta Gorda Code, to allow a detoxification and substance abuse treatment center not pr primarily associated with a primary medical facility within the medical overlay district as a use permitted by special exception. Pursuant to Chapter 26, Section 3.17F4, Punta Gorda Code, a property zoned neighborhood center, address 610 East Olympia Avenue, Punta Gorda, Florida. Okay, so what's gonna happen is staff has 30 minutes to make a presentation and then the applicant has 30 minutes to make their presentation. Then we open it up for public comment and then at the end they both can Reply. respond. Sure. Okay. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official and I have been sworn. I'd like to enter the staff report into the record by reference in its entirety. The request is to operate a residential detoxification and substance abuse treatment center in an existing structure at 610 East Olympia Avenue, located in the neighborhood center zoning district, which is within the medical overlay district. There were some additional findings and concerns that were raised regarding security measures of the facility, and the applicant has provided the following additional information. Security measures will include 32 closed circuit television cameras and 16 cameras installed on each floor. All perimeter doors are actively alarmed 24 hours per day. The center will also have 24 hour staff supervision. The facility will be designated to accommodate 22 clients at a time. Conclusions, conclusion number one. The property is zoned neighborhood center and falls within the medical overlay district. The city's adopted comprehensive plan 2040 defines the medical overlay district. This area exists to promote the development of top, top quality medical services in a campus type approach, which is intended to foster streamlined, seamless, and more efficient <coughs> delivery of medical services. Conclusion number two, the existing 88, 8,865 square foot building, two story building, met the development standards including parking, architecture, and landscaping when constructed in 1993. Conclusion number three, it is staff's opinion that the proposed use of a residential detoxification and substance abuse center would not create any hazardous or conflicting pedestrian or vehicular traffic conditions within the adjacent neighborhood. Conclusion number four, the special exception application is for a residential detoxification and substance abuse center only. Other addiction treatments, including but not limited to sex addiction, gambling addiction, et cetera, are not permitted at this facility. Staff recommended conditions of approval. Facility is required to notify the City of Punta Gorda Police Department immediately if a patient leaves on their own accord without completing the program. Number two, all residents to be accompanied are to be accompanied by a facility staff member during all buddy walks. Three, if a registered sex offender is admitted for treatment under state law, the offender must register with the City of Punta Gorda Police Department 
within 48 hours as required by Florida Statute 775.21, parent 6. Four, any deficient landscaping must be removed and or replaced to conform with the approved landscape plan on file, which is required by code to be maintained in perpetuity. Number five, this approval is for residential detoxification substance abuse center, other addiction treatments, including but not limited to sex addiction and gambling addiction are not permitted. Urban Design recommends approval of SE02-18 with the above stated conclusions and the Punta Gorda Development Review Committee and Planning Commission also recommended approval of the request. Thank you, does that conclude your presentation? Concludes my presentation, thank you. So now the applicant would have time to make their presentation. Good morning, Council Royce Dockrell, Valiant PG Corp. Um, back in November, we purchased the property on Olympia and uh, with the intention of moving forward with bringing an addiction treatment program, residential program to the city of Punta Gorda. Um, at that time, we've started moving forward with, with this process and ended up here today. Um, so wh what we're proposing to do is we're proposing 22 beds for residential inpatient treatment of, of drug and alcohol addiction treatment. Um, I did not realize that we were t not talking about gambling addiction being included in there. It's not, not a big point, but we do get dual diagnosis clients who sometimes have an alcohol addiction and sometimes hand in hand with that does go gambling. So I don't know if that's something that we can can address and, and make any amendments to or not, but. Um, I, can, I can address that real quick. Okay. If they have a dual addiction, but they're, you know, their primary. The primary diagnosis, yeah. Okay. If it's alcohol or, yep. or drugs, it, it, it's fine. Okay. Um, our code does not provide for other types of addictions, so you wouldn't be able to advertise it as a gambling addiction or, sure. or, or other type of an addiction. Fair uh, enough. Program. Yep. Yeah. And in, in our other centers that we, we've ran other centers, for about nine years now. And at that one, we, we do advertise sexual addictions and, and gambling addictions. And so, I mean, we can, you know, remove any advertising that we, we might have on our website currently. I'm not sure that we do or do not. Um, we haven't actively been advertising for this location just because we're waiting for it to obviously be firm and, and concrete with that. But um, in the past, we had done some advertising just to kind of test the waters down here um, to know when it was a viable option for us to branch branch out into a new location, um, and we were we were kind of waiting for things to to become steady and and run without us all the time there at our other program as well, and so that all those things seem to be aligning, and uh, you know we're, we're excited to be able to to move forward down here. Um, so the the building is two stories. Um, one floor would be females, one floor would be males. Um, it just helps to kind of keep the population separate for people being focused on their recovery and not being distracted with the, the opposite sex and all that sort of stuff so that they can focus on what they came there to do. Um, they're always with, with staff. If we, if we go out, we do a go out into the community to go in to a local gym and that sort of thing, go to AA meetings. NA meetings and those sorts of things. They're always with staff when doing those things. Um, the one thing with buddy walks, <coughs> and I don't know if this was just miscommunication on my part, but buddy walk in our vocabulary means that two clients that have been there over a month and have staffs, um, the confidence that they're going to return clean and sober, um, that a buddy would be a peer in program, not a staff member. Um, I don't know if that's, that's an issue or not, but um, clients are randomly drug and alcohol tested, especially if they've gone out for a walk, um, so that they know that when they return, there's going to be some accountability, right? So it, it, when you've got somebody looking over your shoulder, you're less likely to get yourself into trouble and to have a relapse um, than if you don't. And uh, a lot of what we've been hearing in the news with relapses and overdoses are 
tend to be in sober living homes and there tends to be a, a lot less supervision and a lot less accountability. Um, and if somebody does have a relapse, they're not necessarily kicked out at those centers. Um, in our center, if you tested positive for substance or alcohol, um, that would be means for immediate dismissal out of program. Um, I'm not sure what else, if you guys have any questions for me or? I have one question, please. So in that case, the immediate dismissal, they haven't left on their own accord, but you've <coughs> dismissed them. How do they get to where they're going? What is the plan? Um, we would probably call a cab. I, mean, I had a, a, a brief discussion with the police department the other day, and I mean, it, it's our responsibility to you know, kind of escort them off, not the, the police's responsibility. But um, I mean, if it, if it was obviously a, some sort of domestic thing, not where domestic, would the cab go to? Depends, it, it depends where they're from. I mean, ideally, there is enough demand in our, in our local community that they would go to their home. Um, if they were from, from outside of the community, I suppose, to the Pontecourt Airport, I guess. Lynn? What is the average length of stay of one of your patients? Um, 30 to 120 days. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the determination for how long that individual can be there is going to fall into the decision making of their insurance company, um, which is kind of unfortunate, but that's just kind of the, the industry. I'm glad that you have tried and true um, experience prior to coming here with another facility, and, and um, that was one of the questions that I got asked. Um, and also, what is your <coughs> success rate? Success rate is a, is a very tricky thing um, because so much of it depends on the individual and how motivated they are to get better. Um, if they're just here to get, you know, friends and family off their back and they're here for, you know, a break, it, it's not going to work very well, especially if they're only doing a 30-day program. If they're, if they're genuinely wanting to get better and they're willing to do everything, all the work that's put in front of them and all the... the hard work that's asked of them, and they're looking at doing a lengthier program, the longer they're there, the greater the, the results are. Um, the other thing is it's, it's very difficult to gauge how somebody's doing because most often that gauging is done over the telephone by a third party. And so unfortunately, addicts are not known for being honest. And if you're asking them over the phone how they've been doing, you know, ho hopefully we're getting the right answer and hopefully they're doing well, but just because they say they are doesn't really mean they are. So, I, you know, it, with all the statistics in the industry, it, it's really hard to, to accurately gauge those. Um, we have had some really good success with our alcoholic clients because we've got a Soberlink program, which is a portable breathalyzer system. And so we, we really encourage people struggling with alcohol to go home with that unit. And, and what it does is they blow into it morning, afternoon, and before they go to bed. It takes their, their breath sample, their picture, and it archives it all. So with those clients, we're able to go back and actually look and see how they're doing. Um, and with the clients that go home with that, they do really well. I mean, and, it, and it's a fewfold. I mean, they've got, they've got accountability. There's somebody looking over their shoulder. They know they can't get away with a drink because their loved one's gonna get an email if they do. And so if there was a slip, um, a slip is defined as having you know, a couple drinks and getting yourself back up on your feet and, and moving forward, not into a, a full relapse. Um, if they do have a slip, it's usually caught really quickly when they're on a sober link system. And so we're able to get them on the phone, we do some of their aftercare and, and get them dusted up off their feet and, and moving forward again. And so for most centers, when they're, they're counting track record, <coughs> small slips are not included in that. Um, they're, they're looking at you know, overall long-term sobriety. I mean, obviously, if a person is chronically relapsing and slipping, um, then th that's an issue. But uh, so to answer your question, it, it's, it's really difficult too, right? Because so much of it is, is in the ballpark of the individual and whether they really want to get better. Um, you know, industry standard is like 10%. I know ours is higher than that, but it's really difficult to put a number on it. 
just because there's, be, when you offer a program from 30 days to 120 days, obviously the people who stay 120 are doing much better than the people who are staying 30. But we do have lots of great success stories with people who do 30 days, but really are hungry for recovery and they want it. So, but the, the ones that stay 90 or 120 days who maybe were reluctant coming in have had a long enough period of sobriety and a good foundation of learning tools and having a good toolbox to go and face the world with that they still do well even though they were reluctant on coming in. So it, it, it was a very, very lengthy question to answer. Kind of subjective, Sorry. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Nancy. Um, yes, I um, had the opportunity to meet with um, Royce and um, it was a good meeting uh, to help me understand what you do. Um, how do you integrate what you do with other providers here, such as um, Charlotte Behavioral so or Riverside or the sure. you know, which is Bayfront? Yeah. Um, so that it's it's a there's a working with the community, and I know that you you are familiar with um, the Archway Institute that works with Charlotte Behavioral. So. Mm -hmm. So in my discussions with um, Vicki at Charlotte Behavioral, they're primarily a detox center. Um, they do have a few long-term beds where if somebody has finished detoxing and needs some safe place to be until they can transition t into something more long-term, um, then they've got three beds available for that. So they don't provide primary care, um, so they would potentially be looking at referring or recommending to us right now, they have to recommend down to Fort Myers or, you know, places further away, and so I mean, it it's nice to have something something close by. Um, in the beginning, we're not planning on doing detox, but if we don't apply for detox, we won't be allowed to do detox down down the road. So, we've included detox in our description, and uh, but at this point, we're we're going to utilize the resources of the hospital and. and Charlotte behavioral and that sort of thing to, to continue doing that so we can, can focus on getting our, our program up and running without having to deal with all of, all of that stuff. At home we do do detoxes, um, so we are very familiar with that, but it's, it's just it's a little less to, to bite all at once if we can, can piecemeal it a bit. Um, and at the hospital as well, they do detox only. They are starting or and or have done some outpatient treatment. Um, the outpatient treatment they have been doing though is mixed with their mental health patients and so sometimes it brings some complexities because they're coming from different worlds and dealing with different things and so sometimes they don't see eye to eye. Um, so there has been discussions I believe of <coughs> doing an evening course for just drugs and alcohol on an outpatient basis. Um, in our opinion, outpatient is a, is a great thing after you've got some foundation on an inpatient basis for maybe 30 days and then you can start going to a, a less structured environment and trying to use the tools you're doing but still have the support of a counselor and a team where you can go and, and process the week's events and, and all, all those sorts of things. Um, so the hospital as well needs somewhere to, to refer their patients to and so we, Right now, they've been having to refer them, you know, in 45 minutes or an hour out of town. So. Thank you. Any other questions before we open the <coughs> public hearing? Do you have any more presentation? I think I think. Okay, I'm good so for we'll the we'll refer back to you after the we yeah. hear, and then if we have more questions. Okay, this is a public hearing. If you would like to speak on. SE 2-18, now would be the time. Please take this podium to my right. State your name and that you've been sworn, please. And if you need to be sworn, we will swear you in. And you have three minutes. I'm Eunice Wiley. I have been sworn in. I hope I'm not standing here just for formality's sake. I hope this is an, an issue that's really a done deal and that my voice is, will not be heard. Somehow I feel that that probably is what will happen. I stand because I'm concerned as to the location of the proposed uh, center. It is within the area of uh, a community, a community that in the past had been known to have a lot of drug deals going on. I'm hearing about a buddy system. 
I stayed up last night and read everything I could find on this particular program. There were a lot of loose ends, a lot of questions I had. I don't see any completion if after 90 days, let's say a person gets to 75 days and decide I've had enough, I'm leaving. Where are you going? We're dealing with people who have addictions. I do sympathize, no, I empathize with families of people who, who are there with addiction. But so my community will be in a position of receiving again people who normally find a way to hook up for drugs. I don't see answers. Long, longitudinal studies, I feel are needed. We just finished asking for, someone did, numbers. I like concrete things. I heard no numbers. I heard no one say, this is the m amount of people that we've served over a number of years, and these are our successes. If we don't know, how can we make it better? What are we opening our doors to? We're getting ready for Sun Seekers Resort. When I went over the items that listed this program, the first two pages talked about the different type drugs that were in Florida, how they could come into Florida. That's all I saw. If I were an addict, this is the place to be. Ponte Gorda, a possibility of four patrolmen in an area that when we call for them, I probably won't see them. My minutes are up. I'm concerned. You got 20, you're on Ooh, yellow, keep I'm going. I'm concerned. <coughs> so what we need to do right now, you're our gatekeepers. What are we allowing into our new branding of Ponte Gorda? Our children will depend on us. What are we going to allow here? What's, what's the look at on that street? Think about it. Consider it for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, please make your way to the podium for SE02-18. State your name and that Kim you've been Devine, sworn. Kim Devine, Gorda. I have been sworn. I'm not going to repeat everything Eunice said, but as the gentleman said, if someone uh, disobeys the rules, they'll be kicked out. That means they'll be left, they'll have to leave, they'll go into our community and can do whatever they want. And other communities have that problem of attracting more people who are addicted. And the success rate is between 10 and 20%. And I also empathize, but I don't know if we can tell somebody they can't do something, but there will need to be more police, more people to take care of the problem. Thank you. Anybody else to speak on SE02-18? <coughs> My name is Martha Beretta. I have been sworn. Uh, I am a member of the Historic District Homeowners Association. I also have uh, 38 years as a professional counselor and understand the difficulties uh, with addictions. I uh, come because I am very, very concerned about the security issues about the individuals who walk away, about what happens to a community when you do have this kind of facility. It tends to draw drug dealers. I wasn't here in the 80s, but we had a very, very serious problem here. I would not like to see a facility that allows, that advertises the drugs that can be found in our community safety and security of our children and of the people who live in our community is very important. And so I am very much uh, opposed to this. As a professional, I do believe in mental health. I have been an addictions counselor, but this I do not believe is good for our community. Anybody else like to speak on SE02-18? Please make your way to the podium. State your name and that you've been sworn. I have not. 
If there is anyone else who has decided to speak and has not yet been sworn, please rise to be sworn at this time. If you are going to speak, you can make your way up to the podium, please, to expedite the hearing. I would appreciate that. Anybody else to be sworn? Oh, she has them. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I have not sworn. Do you solemnly swear? Do we have? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in today's proceedings? I do. <clears throat> Go ahead. No. Uh, Patricia Niles, uh, Punagorda Condominiums, here in Punagorda. Um, I am a recovering alcoholic. I'll be celebrating 34 years uh, this June 7th. I did go in and out of treatment. I know what um, relapse, they call relapse is. Back in the 80s, they took that. It seemed like more serious then. It wasn't given as part of treatment. It was expected to be something very unusual to happen, and that's how the programs were set up back then. Um, I'm concerned on this issue a lot for Punta Gorda, and just hearing something like um, the walking with two clients going together walking, um, that's just a very big flag for me and what I was like back then. 30 days means rather very little. It just means you put 30 days together and you didn't pick up a drink or a drug. That is it. You don't have any of the tools to stay off your drug or sober if you leave. I had to go, I went, ended up going to four treatment centers and this was for alcohol. The first one I went to, uh, it was Chit Chat, which was one of the top treatment centers in the United States, and I went back out drinking uh, soon after that, show the tools that I had at that point. Went back to another one that was located in Binghamton, New York, near the hospital. Six months after that, I went back out. And each time you get worse and worse and worse in your addiction, whatever it is, General Electric sent me to Marworth. I told them I wasn't ready to leave after 30 days, and they sent me to Alina Lodge, a long-term treatment center in Blairstown, New Jersey. And since then, I have not picked up a drink or anything else. I think if you're not familiar with this, you're out of your league. If you're on this city council and you don't know about treatment, I suggest you hold back today and you get yourself some people from treatment centers that have been around the block. If you don't do that, you're asking for a lot of trouble for Punta Gorda. I know what my attitudes were back then, and I know I'm a nice person. I was a nice person back then. But this idea, just as an example, two people who are clients, walking around in downtown Punta Gorda is mad, absolutely mad. Uh, if, I got 30 seconds. Please, get some people. I will find them for you at these treatment centers that you need to listen to and find out what the real process is. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Mueller, I am only the recipient